Hello there, this is Professor Gavor. I want to cover Chapter 2 of the Flat World textbook and strategy and technology. Uh, so we're going to talk about concepts and frameworks for achieving success. Well, in the world of IT, I, I definitely think, and I teach supply chain management, and I teach some IT, and of course, everything has to be aligned to the corporate strategy. You know, let's put in a computer system that has nothing to do with the corporate strategy. Well, that, that would be foolish. Let's uh, put in a global supply chain that uh, doesn't line up with the corporate strategy. That would be insane. So we really want to have that together. And I'll probably emphasize more in this uh, video lecture than even last time the importance of the IT being strategy and business driven by the business people and it enables, it facilitates, it makes the achievement of that strategy possible with less people and more effectively. So the learning objectives for this first section of this is talk about operational effectiveness, understand the limitations of technology based on competition, um, and leveraging this principle. Uh, we wanna talk about strategic positioning, the importance of grounding, competitive advantage in this concept, understand the resource-based view of competitive advantage, list the four characteristics of resources, uh, of a resource that might possibly yield sustainable competitive advantage. As soon as you start talking uh, competitive advantage and sustainable competitive advantage, it should be a flag and, and it, not a surprise to anybody that's taken a fair number of business courses that this is going to be heavily um, related to Michael Porter's work. So sustainable competitive advantage, I mean, that's what everybody would like to have, right? I'd like to have an edge that no one else can copy. And uh, boy, that would be great for my financial performance as uh, if I offer products and services that people want and need and I can do it better than anybody else and they can't copy me, mm, wonderful. So we're talking about a sustainable competitive advantage is financial performance that constantly outperforms industry averages. And it's difficult to achieve because of a rapid emergence of new products, new competitors, new technology that um, can help people leapfrog where they were to where you are or where you used to be. Uh, competitors cut costs, cut prices, and increase features in order to achieve comparative advantage. Um, they want, I mean, if, you know, in a world of quality management, I look at uh, quality costs and delivery. What is the cost of your goods and services? Um, what is the quality of them? And then delivery can be two things. It can be how quickly you can deliver the products and services based on an order to a customer, or it also could be how quickly you can develop new products. Either one of those two will give you advantage. So the rational consumer, if you it, it would buy from a company that has an advantage in terms of quality, cost, or delivery, over the norm in the industry. That's the way I look at it. So Porter helped, you know, he's written several books on the subject and he talks about the value chain and the five forces to achieve uh, comparative value and comparative versus competitive. Uh, I'll let you look that up. I think it's exactly what it means. So he talks about firms defining themselves according to the operational effectiveness. Um, you know, can suffer margin eroding competition. Well, operational effectiveness, performing the same task better than rivals. That's what that means. And it could be relative to yourself, just improving operational effectiveness. People are looking at that all the time. Uh, the danger lies in, in the similarity and failure to innovate. It's the innovation that, that helps take you to a new place. 
and technology sometimes is a way to do that, especially if you can harness what we've called a disruptive technology. So you need that when the offerings are roughly the same and your industry or your product or service is at a risk of being a commodity. So a commodity is a basic good that can be interchanged with nearly identical offerings of others. Uh, one of the things, if you think of, um, well, I don't know these days, but it, it, when I was your age, probably, and the Apple of that era was Sony, they had a competitor called Panasonic. Sony was the innovator. They innovated the, and marketed um, and were responsible for the proliferation of the transistor radio, the cassette player, the CD player, the Walkman. And then when their owner, um, uh, Morita, passed away, Akio Morita, uh, the company went into kind of a tailspin because they, they didn't have someone else to take over the company. And I, I think it was almost at the same time that Apple emerged and took over the music business from them with their iPod and their uh, Apple iTunes. But Panasonic was what they called a fast follower. They would watch Sony's efforts, learn from their successes and missteps, and then enter the market quickly with a comparable or superior product at a lower cost. Well, their Panasonic's weren't superior, but they were definitely at a lower cost. They would look at Sony's design and rip cost out of them and come up with a fast follower and did very, very well. Um, in fact, did Sony may have a misstep? Sure. They, um, when, when video camcorders and uh, video players came out on the market, they went with a proprietary system they developed called Beta, Beta Max. The rest of them went VHS. The rest of the entire industry went VHS, led probably by Panasonic. And um, sorry, I've got a phone call that I'm not going to answer because I have no idea who it is. So we'll just let it ring for a while and uh, have a little time. So anyway, Panasonic went with VHS, as did the rest of the industry. And Sony was by themselves. The VHS was cheaper. More people bought it, even though the, the beta was uh, probably a superior format and superior quality. But Sony was not able to produce the price and get the... the um, what do they call it? Um, mass market enough to lower the price. So VHS won. Gee, that was, phone call was very disruptive. I apologize for that. Anyway, the danger of relying on technology, uh, because technology can be matched quickly, firms that pioneer in technology are especially susceptible to this problem. So strategic positioning is performing different activities than rivals or the same activities in a different or better way. And technology should be able to create and enable novel business approaches that are defensively different. Well, when we talk about sustainable competitive advantage, sometimes, you know, sustainable kind of makes it sound like we want to do it forever. Can you do it forever? Well, look at Amazon as an example of a company that's done it for a long time. And I think we commented in, in the previous video that other companies just don't have the same feel of an Am placing an order with Amazon. Amazon is so easy to use. Their app, their website, however you access them, you can, and they have a wide variety of products. You can look and, and, and buy things. When I go on other um websites of other companies, it's not so easy to order, always. 
And you would think that everybody could match what Amazon does, but not so much. Now, if this is just software for the most part, we're not even talking about the technology that they've applied in their warehouses where there's actual physical goods, physical items that they've developed. They're robotic pallet movers, for example, that really give them a sustained competitive advantage. And they keep innovating the way they run their warehouses. And they're at the cutting edge of that. And everybody else in the world is just trying to play catch up. But you would think, even given that, the companies that compete with Amazon for online service uh, online uh, sales should be able to offer products as you know you should be able to place your order as easily as you can on Amazon and track it as easily and it's not always the case. So if we're talking fresh direct here, um, this defines the land the grocery landscape in New York City and beyond. Um, they're a company that created a a, a business to uh, you know workers shift. Shifts are highly efficient. Firm buys and prepares its own goods. Higher inventory turns the number of times inventory is sold during a given period. Um, the more you turn your inventory, especially if you're selling perishable goods, the better. If you turn your inventory once a year and you sell tomatoes, um, clearly 90% uh, of your tomatoes are going to rot. If, you, if you're selling something like tomatoes, you've probably got to turn your inventory every two days, every three days max. Uh, they use artificial intelligence and climate-controlled rooms. and exchange, they have more favorable supplier terms with stores, uh, uh, sharing data to improve supplier sales and operations, and paying in days rather than weeks. They've differentiated themselves from their competition in a way. I just uh, realized, read that they were bought by Ahold, um, a grocery chain, and I will post some uh, readings about that to enhance this presentation. So what are the kinds of differences we're talking about? We're talking about resource-based view of competitive advantage. So the strategic thinking approach suggests that if a firm is able to maintain a sustainable competitive advantage, it must control something, an exploitable resource or set of resources that have four characteristics. It's got to be valuable. It's got to be rare. It's got to be imperfectly imitable. And it's got to be non-substitutable. Well, I think if you look at uh, Amazon, they, they've done that in their back office, in their warehouses, for sure. It's valuable. It's rare. Their warehouses operate and are designed for online better than anybody else's. They're, um, you can imitate them, but you're always playing catch up because they're always innovating. And um, you can't use their proprietary stuff because they've got patents probably. For their ordering software, you would think it's more. It's valuable. It's rare because I'm shocked that no one else can do it as well as they do, or very few can do it as well as they do. It is imitable, I think. I mean, because it's just software. You get some better software programmers, and you can imitate it. You can reverse engineer what they do. You can create the look and feel. And it's non-substitutable. I think it could be, but I don't know why it isn't. So these last two things, um, I'm not quite sure why other people haven't imitated them and created a substitute. And maybe an even a firm offering that platform that makes it so easy to do. But there's something about Amazon's way of doing it that other people have not been able to, to duplicate. And maybe they haven't um, assigned the resources to it. So resource-based thinking helps avoid entering markets simply because growth is spotted. In the next section, let's talk about we want to understand technology is used often to enable competitive advantage. That's what we talked about last time with, with Walmart in the 1990s. They were the first ones to really use an ERP six, uh, effectively. And they it, it fostered their growth nationally and internationally. 
And we want to look at some firms that have used technology to organize, sustain competitive advantage, understand the value chain concept, and be able to examine and compare how various firms organize or bring products and services to market, recognize the role of techno that technology can play in crafting an imitation-resistant value chain, as well as when technology choice may render potentially strategic assets less effective. That's a really couple complicated learning objectives. Um, we want to define the following concepts, brand scale, data, switching cost assets, differentiation, network effects, distribution channels. Well, this is in my bailiwick of operations management, certainly. Understand and provide examples of how technology can be used to create or strengthen the resources mentioned above. So powerful resources. Um, here are some powerful uh, major sources of competitive advantage. Recognize an organization's opportunities and vulnerabilities. Brainstorm winning strategies. I don't know, that sounds ridiculously obvious to me. And, and firms with effective strategic position can create assets that reinforce one another. This creates advantages that are difficult for rivals to successfully challenge. I think, again, going back to my favorite, which seems to be Amazon today, um, I think their advantage in terms of channel and their ability to fulfill orders and are, are, are leading the way to uh, the last mile, you know, same day delivery, essentially, I think is a tremendous uh, competitive advantage for them. And they're constantly tweaking and changing this model. So imitation resistant. Um, it's a, obviously is exactly what it says, a value chain, a way of doing business that competitors struggle to replicate and involves technology in a key role. Amazon is a technology company. Their ordering platform, for whatever reason, is not imitable very easily. They're, they took their distribution center, most, most, most traditional retailers have distribution centers, and they have stores. That's Walmart. And the distribution center and the store are both warehouses. One is geared for customers to come and shop in. That's the store. The other one is designed to receive goods in full pallets and redistribute them in full pallets to all the stores. What Amazon did was consolidate those two. They took the warehouse and they took the store and made him one entity. So now the warehouse is not designed for receiving and storing in full pallets and shipping out in full pallets. It's designed for receiving in full pallets, storing as individual items, selecting individual items, and shipping them directly to consumers. The rest of the world is still trying to catch up with how they do that. So the value chain that we're talking about is a set of activities. It's basically your supply chain, activities in which a product or service is created and delivered to customers. It's the business process of a supply chain. So, for example, elements in Fresh Direct's value chain uh, work together to create and reinforce competitive advantages that others cannot easily copy. And I will say, in terms of Amazon, it's a combination of IT, information technology, business process, and physical, you know, kind of material um, moving equipment that is a physical technology that does this. So, Other competitors are have to maybe they're going to be between two business models. The one they have, and they're unable to reap, you know, maybe reap the full ad advantage of the market leader. So their example here with Fresh Direct is late moving rivals struggle 
as fresh directs lead time allows it to develop brand scale data and other advantages that newcomers lack. The same is true probably if we think of social media. Um, it's you know there was a time where social media companies were being created left and right, and uh, you didn't know which one was going to take off. It seems like we've we've settled in on the Facebook family, the Google family, and the Twitter-ish kind of thing. Uh, and, you know, there's TikTok. But it's hard to create something new because, well, one, if you become successful, the bigger players will just buy you. And it's hard, I think, to create another Facebook right now. That's kind of got to be a disruptive technology environment where that can happen. So the framework of the value chain, this is pure Porter. You look at and notice when we talk about value chain, it's in it's another aspect, which I would call the supply chain, inbound logistics, the, the receiving of raw and packing materials or goods that you're bringing in. Uh, your operation, which um, transforms those inbound materials to the finished goods that you sell. And the outbound logistics is the delivery of those to your the customers that buy directly from you. Uh, marketing and sales is added to the supply chain to make it the value chain. Because if you can't um, market and sell it, no matter how good this first three parts are, you're not going to sell it. So you need that, and the two have to be aligned. And then if there's any service involved, uh, and service could be like an automotive dealer that uh, services the cars, or it could be handling returned goods, which is uh, a, an immense part of uh, online sales. Even though there was an article recently that talked about Many companies, because of COVID, don't want the goods back. And there's no value sometimes. And Amazon, I think, led the way. If you say, I don't want the good, they say, okay, well, credit your account. Where should I send it back? Don't send it back. Well, they don't want the risk of COVID germs, but that's not really it. What's really it in this case is the fact that if I buy a phone case from Amazon. It cost me twelve dollars, and they've shipped it to me, and they've made whatever scant margin they make in a twelve-dollar phone case. If I decide I get it, and gee, I don't like the feel of it, I don't like how it fits on my phone, I'm not happy with it. I call them back. I said I want to return. You know, I go through the return process. They credit my account and say, "Don't return it." It's a twelve-dollar item. If they were to pay for shipping to go back, let's say that's only two, three dollars maybe $5, and then they have the restocking, they have to open the pack, have someone open the package. The individual package is an inbound return logistics as opposed to an inbound full pallet of these things. And then restock it, put it back into stock and type numbers into a laptop or on the little computer that's on the wrist to put it back into stock. They if the, even if they sell it again for $12, they, they, will, they will not make money on it. It's not worth for them to take it back. And sometimes, surprisingly, this is true for items that cost $20, $30, $40. $40. So it's kind of interesting how, how this works. I'm sorry I went off on a little tangent, but sometimes that's the most interesting part of my course in the feedback that I hear the stories that I tell around the concepts that we're, we're talking about. So this is assisted by firm in infrastructure, human resource management, technology, research program development, procurement, and they leave off something here, which I think is critical. Business process development and business process improvement, which relies on these four things, certainly. So infrastructure, they talk about general management, planning, finance, and information systems. But it also is your physical structure uh, and, and, and 
coordination of how your business is constructed. And for Amazon, it's the physical nature of their um, fulfillment centers. HRM is recruiting, hiring, training, developing people to make sure you, they're right. I think Amazon does brilliantly at that. Technology, uh, which is the R&D that creates their little pallet robots, but it's also the R&D that keeps their um, web portal, you know, their ordering portal so good. And then procurement. Well, once you get big enough like your Amazon, you can buy goods for so cheap. You know, you wonder why it costs you, if you're a college kid and your grandmother makes you a tin of cookies and she's put all the love and care into it and probably has used about $8 of ingredients or $10 of ingredients to make these cookies, but it costs her $12 to ship it to you. The reason for that is because the largest shipper in the world now parcel shipper is Amazon. Who gets the biggest discount? Them. Who gets the least discount? You. You send what? What do we send out of our house? Uh, 70 packages a year versus the millions upon millions of packages sent out by Amazon? No wonder there's a, a difference in cost. Um, firms may have a critical competitive asset that they have an imitation resistant value chain. The robots, look up Amazon's uh, robotic pallet movers. Uh, value chain framework can be used to consider a firm's differences and distinctiveness compared to its rivals. Um, I guess Direct Fresh, would, I, I'm not as familiar with them as I am with Amazon, which is why I'm using that example more. But everything about Amazon seems to work better. And once people shudder if Amazon enters your space, a couple of years ago, when um, Amazon bought PillPack and decided to get into uh, the pharmaceuticals fulfillment, uh, CVS and Walgreens saw what was coming, and they're pretty good at it themselves, but they didn't want to get Amazon out of business. They knew Amazon was serious about getting into it when they bought this company and worked very hard making alliances with other healthcare uh, insurers. In fact, I think Walgreens bought one and CVS made an alliance with one so they would have a captured market. The other thing is the healthcare people started looking at it. If Amazon gets into pharmaceuticals and they already self-insure their own employees and they're quickly becoming a large employer in the United States, what's to stop them from being a health insurer a competitor. It's, it's very amazing how the, the model uh, of Amazon is can morph and grow. And it scares other people when they see Amazon starting to, to infringe on their business. Look at FedEx. FedEx was did a lot of business trans, uh, transporting parcels for Amazon. They got a divorce. FedEx does not work with them and will work wants to work with every competitor to Amazon. And FedEx, FedEx stumbled because of this. It's crazy. So analysis of a firm's value chain can re reveal operational weaknesses, which is, I think, what Amazon does when they look at how do we get into the pharmaceutical business? How can we do this in a way that is in our strength? ordering everything online and ordering um, that the competitors don't do. If I think about Walgreen and I think about CVS, um, you know, I have several prescriptions that I get on every three months. Well, they're all separate prescriptions and CVS and Walgreens are unable to sync them so that they're just, let's, let's, Hey, same day they're within a week or two all these prescriptions but they should have a way to be able to sync them so it becomes a one stop one pickup one bag with everything you need and that way you can deliver it one time they do that 
Now I get the pills, I bring them home, and I've got to uh, put them in a little, you know, the little plastic, you know, thing where it says, you know, Monday morning, Monday afternoon, if it's like that, and they put the pills in the order I'm supposed to take them and sort them all out. Well, okay, I'm not real old yet. I can still do that. If I'm like mm, a little bit marginal about, you know, physical dexterity and a little bit marginal about mental dexterity, you know, you got old people that are putting the wrong pills in the wrong times and they, they get mixed up and take the wrong dosages and hurt themselves. Pill pack, which is what Amazon bought, will take all your prescriptions and how often you're supposed to take them and put them into pouches. They pack the pills, not here's a 30 day supply of, of, of prescription one, 30 day or, or 90 day supply of prescription one, 90 day supply of prescription two, both in separate uh, bottles and prescription three. They will take them and say, okay, if you're supposed to take prescription A twice a day, and you're supposed to take prescription two at night only, and prescription three, um, maybe you have to take it three times a day, morning, noon, and night, uh, all of a sudden you'll get a big box, and it'll have pouches uh, that are, you know, uh, perforated and all attached to each other, and it'll say, day one, it'll tell you the date, um, January 21st morning, you open it up and there's, um, pill, you know, prescription three and prescription one, uh, the dosage that you take that morning, the noon pouch for that same day will only have prescription three in it. The evening pouch will have, um, prescription one, two, and three in it. And Amazon sorts this all out. Think about the technology for, for that. There's a physical technology, the machinery that does it, that does the sorting and does the pill packing, hence the name of the company, Pill Pack. And, but then think of the innovation. If CVS and Walgreens can't even coordinate to get my three prescriptions in the same bag, they're at a competitive disadvantage or a competitive disadvantage. Amazon did their homework. They looked at this and they said, we can steal some of their lunch. Might not be right away, but we will do it. So technology is a great benefit. This is both IT, it's information systems, and it's a physical technology, the marriage of both, and combined with a business process, which is the way you get competitive advantage. If you have a superior IT system, information technology system, you have superior machinery that does the pill sorting, and you have a superior business process that combines all of these three, two, the other two things together, it's really hard to beat. Okay. Firms can buy software and tools. There's supply chain management tools. There's uh, customer relationship tools. There's uh, enterprise resource planning software, which combines the other two things. But the great danger is adopting software changes a unique process into a generic one. Yep. That's possible. It is true, but it's still your business process. It's how you use the software and what technology you use and how you organize your back offices to take advantage of all that. We know what a brand is. If you've taken any marketing course, it's the, it's the image of the product or service that you sell. A strong brand is an ex exceptionally powerful resource for competitive advantage. But brand name alone is not enough. We know this. Consumers use brands to decide which company's products are better. I mean, if you go to the, let's stick with pharmaceuticals again, you go into a Walgreens or CVS and you say, I want, you know, 200, 400 Advil, ibuprofen, and it costs you, I don't know, let's say $20. Right next to it is a Walgreens or CVS brand of ibuprofen. And it says, why pay more? And it only costs $14 for 400. Now you have to make the decision. Is the quality 
of the name brand Advil superior to the CVS or Walgreens branded store brand. Am I getting $6 of higher quality? Or is it $6 better in my pocket, which I can go to Starbucks and get two Grande Americanos? Your choice. And a lot of people, you know, the branding has switched from the goods to the store over time. Certainly in the 80s, it was the brand that was popular. Store brands were horrible. But in the interim, Walmart has become a brand that dictates to the brands they sell. And their store brands are every bit as good. And Walgreens and CVS have done the same thing. So you've got to watch Amazon brand. Do I want to spend, if I buy a sleeve of uh, 20 AA batteries uh, and I can get uh, Duracell and it costs me $25, you know, $20 for that. Or can I buy the Amazon brand? And I know that Amazon probably has Duracell or somebody like that making them. They don't have their own battery making plant. Kirkland brand, same thing. It's the brand of Costco, not, it's not the brand of the good or the service that you're buying anymore. So technology helps in rapidly and cost effectively strengthening a brand. It can certainly do that. And this has worked for stores and moved it from the brand of the good and service more to the brand. Now, the reason that some things like bar soap, for example, it's really expensive to get into. So the brand name bar soaps, which have all gone to liquid soaps anyway, but for the longest time, it was hard to have generic bar soaps because the cost, the fixed cost of the equipment was so high. And there was another thing that people worried about branding and generic and making store brands. If your company starts, if you have a branded product like Campbell's Soup, do you start making store brand soups for Kroger? Well, Kroger is going to get store brand soups anyway. Should you make it for them or do you undercut your own business? Significant question. To have to be answered. Scale. Well, scale is how much of the stuff do you sell? We talked about scale when we talked about Betamax and we talked about VHS earlier in this. And Betamax could never get the scale. VHS took over the market and their scale was much larger, which meant the fixed cost of the factories that made those things, the, the, the fixed cost per unit was much less. So businesses benefit from economies of scale. The costs are spread out, and the costs that are spread out is not the variable cost, but even though variable costs, if you're making more and buying more, you have a better buying power, and you can buy the raw and packing materials for less, the ingredients that go into the finished product for less. But also, if you have a large scale, a large volume, your fixed costs are broken up across that as well. So your fixed cost per unit goes down dramatically. Organizations are scalable if they benefit from the scale economies as they develop. What remains to be seen is how Amazon manage and they get bigger and bigger and try to provide same day delivery more and more for as many goods as they can, especially groceries. Their number of warehouses have to increase. So how do they manage that cost? That's, that's an interesting question that I don't have the answer to. Uh, developing firms may gain bargaining power with their suppliers. Um, at, you know, if they can grow your business quickly. If not, you're paying a lot for, you're paying a lot more for things. Uh, switching costs and data. So consumers, 
you know, it's incurred when consumers switch from one product to another. Is there really how much cost is there in it? Firms that seem dominant but that do not have high switching costs can rapidly outshine rivals. In other words, if it's easy to do, the switching cost of a bank, it's just a pain in the neck to switch all your accounts from one bank to another, especially if you're online and you have a mortgage and credit cards and everything from the bank. It's going to be very hard to switch. The high switching costs there. But if I'm buying batteries or Advil or whatever the case may be, and I walk into the store or I see it on my online screen and says, you know, the branded product costs this and the store brand or Amazon brand or Costco brand or Walmart brand equivalent costs this. You know, if it's twenty dollars versus fourteen, sticking with the numbers we had before, why don't I try the fourteen? Can I tell the difference between the Advil? No, I'll continue to buy the fourteen. Can do the batteries seem to last just as long as the the brand, the name brand, and just because it says Amazon, Walmart, or, or Kirkland on it, I'm going to buy. If they last just as long, why wouldn't I save the money? Quality cost delivery. So, you notice that we haven't talked about information technology. And we're on slide 20 of, of this presentation. And it's not about IT. It's about business and having IT support that. And the support is business process, as we talked about. It's about the physical machinery technology, and it's about the information technology. So if we can do that and integrate those three in a way that other people can, you've got some comparative and competitive advantage going there. So firms that seem dominant but do not have high switching costs can rapidly outshine their strong rivals which is why store brands are moving to, are taking over for the branded goods. And the branded goods are not as powerful as they used to be. So you want to look at learning costs, information and data, financial commitment, contractual commitments, search costs, loyalty programs, all of those things help tie you to something. And the more you can get from one source, the reason I think Costco does very well is people have a Costco lifestyle. They have an Amazon lifestyle. They can go there and buy almost everything they need. Why go someplace else? Costco, you can't buy every brand there, but more and more so on Amazon, you can. So differentiation. Commodities are products or services that are nearly identical offered from multiple vendors. Well, they talk about gold and wheat. Think about batteries. Are batteries now a commodity? Did they used to be, you know, you had the Energizer with the bunny and you had the Duracell with the copper top. And, oh, boy, they're better batteries. And Duracell, when they first came out, were better batteries to me. I used them all the time. But now they're just alkaline batteries. Advil, when it came out with ibuprofen, was a superior product. Well, the over-the-counter pharmaceuticals, if you have faith that the company that's making them uses the same diligence or approximately the same diligence as the company that makes Advil, why shouldn't I buy the generic ibuprofen? So you, it's the commoditization. I think one thing I want to say here is the better your IT system and integrated with your business process, because when you get the commodity, it becomes cost, cost, cost. So if you could provide the same product for less cost, and part of the cost is that supports a branded name product like Duracell and Advil, is the advertising they have to do. Amazon is a thing. 
if I put Amazon on the battery, I don't have to advertise the battery. The, the name has already been advertised. It's already part of the thing. Duracell has to keep advertising Duracell to keep up. So now, and if Amazon controls the purchase of the goods, the branding of the good, and the IT system and business process, which gets that good from basically when it gets into their hand to your hand faster and cheaper, whew, comparative advantage, competitive advantage. So technology is used by firms want to differentiate the goods and services. And part of the differentiation that I think is happening, if we're talking about consumer goods for the most part, is cost and delivery. The goods have been, if the goods get commoditized, that's where the competition goes. I feel like I'm sermonizing here. And you can laugh at this because I laugh at it. Okay. Network effects. When the value of a product or service increases, it edits its number of users expand. So it's you're talking about network externalities or Metcalf's law. I'm not sure what Metcalf's law is. We should probably look it up. Switching costs play a role in determining the strength of network effects. Um, you know, and, and it's almost like a lure. Let me, oh, my wife has not used Amazon very much. When she wants to buy something and she wants to have it delivered and she wants it to be no nonsense, she'll ask me, I'll just look it up on Amazon and say I can get it, blah, 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 blah. And I just take care of it for her and it's delivered. Um, when she goes on other websites, which she uses a lot for her online shopping, it's always a pain. Always a pain. So switching caught you know you get lured into an ad i know if she starts using it she'll almost use it exclusively so especially when i don't have to have it delivered to my house repackage it and deliver it to whoever we're sending a gift to so they have to deliver it to their house and if you have amazon prime it's the the, the delivery is free You've paid a fee for it, but you it's its the same model as Costco. You pay an annual fee, but if you use it, it pays for itself and then some. So strong asset for firms that can control and leverage a leading standard. So this network effect is, is critical. And that you can be, you know, you the value of a product or service increases as the number of users expand because the buying power of the people that buy the products or services increases the store, the, the managing entity of the product or service, the company that provides them to you, their buying power increases all across the board and they become huge. One thing I forgot to say too is Amazon when they broke up with FedEx, they're creating their own transportation system. They became a competitor in a sense. Right now it's just in-house to FedEx. And this defies business lore. Previously, up until Amazon's, you know, let's say 2010, 2005, they used to ask the question, core competency. You don't hear that as much anymore. What's our core competency? Well, it's providing batteries or it's providing Advil to consumers. Doing research, uh, development, coming up with new products, um, manufacturing these goods. Is distribution our core competency? Oh, no, it's not. Let's outsource it. Is HR our core competency of our company. No, let's outsource it. So people were vertically disintegr you know, vertically divesting. They weren't integrating. Uh, early on, think of the auto industry, Ford Motor Company, used to make every part of every car except for the rubber parts, which he had his friend 
Harvey Firestone make for them, which are the tubes and, you know, the rubber hoses and tires. And um, everything else they made. Everything else they made themselves. Well, what is the core competency of Ford Motor Company? Designing and assembling cars. Is it designing and, and, and creating and manufacturing spark plugs? No. Uh, maybe designing and assembling engines? Yes. Um, is it designing and assembling wire harnesses? Uh, it used to be, but no more. Is it making automotive glass? Uh, it used to be, but it is no more. They, die, they spun off all these businesses, which still become kind of like part of the Ford family because if you spun if it was your company, you spun it off and 90% of what you buy is still from them. It's kind of, you know, kind of a, what the Japanese call it, Koretsu. But it, it's, it, it's not that anymore. So for the longest time, companies were not doing everything. Um, do I want to own my own trucks to deliver my goods? No, let's let a trucking company do that. I don't want to have the maintenance of trucks, the purchase of trucks, the, the hiring and vetting of drivers and all that. But Amazon turned that around and is vertically integrating everything. In fact, they're not buying a fleet of trucks. They're having independent people. They, they Uberized it. They took Uber's idea and Uberized it. So if I want to go buy a Mercedes-Benz, I forgot the name of the, the actual van, but the step van, and go into the Amazon delivery business, you know, I get a little training, I have a cell phone, I know where to pick up orders and where to deliver them, and I can work as long or as little as I want. If I want to make a lot of money, I work longer. If I want to make... You know, just as a hobby, it's almost like Uber. Can it be a full-time job? Mm, that I don't know. Can it be an income supplement? Definitely. You know, it's a choice people make. I don't think half the stuff I get delivered is not from Amazon employees, but they are captive suppliers to Amazon. And it works pretty good. Distribution channels, oh boy, we've, we've talked about that. Um, I mean, I outlined how um, Amazon is organized and how they took that, what they call eliminated the middleman. They had uh, two, two entities, you know, Walmart has um, their distribution centers and their stores, both of which are warehouses, but for different purposes. Amazon figured out a way to combine those both into one fulfillment center, and therefore it doesn't need the brick and mortar, as much brick and mortar as a Walmart needs. And therefore, one less movement is more efficient, too. One less load and unloading of goods and storing them on a shelf saves them money. So the distribution channel, how do you get the goods to people? And this is enabled ridiculously enabled by IT. You need a strong, a really good business process, and the business process has to have a really good enablement, marriage. It has to be integrated fully with an IT system. And this network technology is what we're talking about. And here they're talking about third parties that promote a product or service for a cut of any sales. Well, let's talk about the affiliates being um, the Uberized Amazon drivers that are all controlled by a business process married to the backbone nerve structure of that business process is the IT system which Amazon has put together. And that people are going to have a hard time copying. So it's interesting to look at it. Uh, if we look at here, they have a uh, rank firm and sales per square feet. They look at Apple stores. They look at um, Generation Next brands, 
Murphy's USA gas and convenience store. Murphy's USA is the gas station that's at all Walmarts. Tiffany & Company Jewelry, Lululemon, which is interesting. I wonder what the sales per square feet is for an Amazon Fulfillment Center. I don't know that we have that information. I know I don't. I'd love to have it. What about patents? Well, you can protect things. Patents protect us from copyrights. Uh, and, and you have, can you patent an algorithm? Yes, you can. Can you get around that by creating an almost equivalent algorithm, which is the coded subroutine, if you will, that uh, gives you that competitive advantage? Yeah, you can. It's easier to do that. Can you engineer a like product? If Amazon has pallet moving robots, and it's, let's say they're on their nth generation, I don't know what, and maybe it's five, maybe it's 10. Can I get around their patent? Yeah, sure. Of course you can. You make the design different. You've got the concept. They, the concept is there. You've got to come up with a different design and different software. And, and you probably have to have patent attorneys that tell you, yeah, it's different enough. We can patent ours. I mean, look at the drugs that came out for, well, right now, the, the, the vaccines. They're all patented. They're all different. And they all came out around the same time. It was an instant commodity almost. So, and, and I think the last section that we have here, let's, what are we going to talk about? The learning objections. Understand a relationship between timing, technology, and the creation of resources for competitive advantage. Argue effectively when faced with broad generalizations about the importance or lack of importance of technology and timing to competitive advantage. Um, oh, I think it's really important. Remember, my way of looking at this is three things. It's business process. It's the physical machinery kind of technology. And it's the information technology all married together in a way that, that that no one else can copy. Or it was really hard for them to, to do that. Recognize the difference between low barriers to entry and the prospects for sustainability of a new entrance effort. I, Amazon doesn't mind competition. If someone starts and does something very well, they buy them. Much like they did... Um, the shoe company, Zappos, and they Amazon it, make it their own. So barriers to entry for many tech-centric businesses are low. Can I start an Uber business? Sure, I can. I can start, I, uh, all I have to do is write the software. I don't have brick and mortar. I don't have all, you know, I can buy server time. I can start small in one city, and I can... Um, expand it later and the software is very scalable if it works on a small level you just need more server space to grow it uh, market entry does not necessarily result in building a sustainable business that's the other thing can you offer it as well or better I mean I was reading an article today that they talk about delivery services for food well gee whiz I mean is it cheaper for me to jump in my car and go pick it up myself or on a $20 order? Or do I want to pay $7? All of a sudden, my meal is $20 up to 7 Well, if I have meetings all day long and I want to get a sandwich from Subway or uh, Jimmy John's or whatever, uh, well, I can be in a meeting. I can at home on my, like I'm recording this. I can go on the Jimmy John's app. On my phone, I can order it. It'll come here. I don't have to take time out from my busy day. Um, I can just put myself on hold, go pick it up, have my sandwich sitting here, and in between uh, 15 minutes I have or a half hour between two meetings, I can do that. Is that Jimmy John's doesn't charge for the delivery? Why would I use DoorDash on the same thing? 
a ten dollar lunch sandwich it cost me seven dollars to have it delivered it doesn't make sense so market entry does not necessarily result in building a sustainable business that is a real challenge and we've seen it in social media we've seen it in online stores yeah how many startups have there been with fully prepared meals there's blue apron there's uh, you know think of it they, they advertise them on tv they start them all the time an interesting interesting business is carvana it's completely it but you got to realize also it has two things if they they have to have the cars they have to have a location for them they have to prep them to some degree they have to take pictures of the cars they have to get the car to you, which means they have to have a rel relatively sophisticated system to do all that. And they're obviously spent a lot of money on advertising. I almost bought a car from them this past summer. In the end, I didn't because I did. I was not convinced the car was exactly what I wanted it to be. I was really close to pulling a trigger on it, though. So it'll be interesting to see what a company like that does. Uh, diagram the five forces of competitive advantage. Apply the framework to an industry. Oh, you're going to do that in your strategic management course, your capstone course. I, I think that, or if not in even other courses that you look at, but... What you want to look at the five forces is what's the power of the suppliers? Who has the leverage relationship? This is Porter's five forces. Uh, do the suppliers have the power or do you? Well, I think of, you know, uh, Walmart. Almost everybody they buy from, Walmart is responsible for 40, 50, 60% of their business. Walmart has the power there. The suppliers don't have power. On the other hand, when I worked at Colgate Palmolive and we used to buy from Exxon, some, some chemicals from Exxon, well, we were fingernail clipping of their entire business. Who has the power in that relationship? Who's the 800 pound gorilla? Exxon. We, if we tried to pressure Exxon and it was, we could only buy, they were the only people that made this. Uh, we want, we, you know, if we do what we do to a small mom and pop supplier, and call them in and say, hey, listen, we want you to reduce price and this and that. And Exxon would just say, you're fingernail clipping in my business. I don't need it. I'm not, you have no leverage here. In fact, we're going to raise the prices. So there. Who has the power in that relationship? Um, what is the threat of substitute products or services? Part of the reason Exxon could do that is there was no substitutes. If there's other competitors, Competitors, you can have an, uh, a, a bid put out that's competitive and order that way. But the other thing is, what do you make? If you're Duracell and Energizer, when you're the two big battery innovators, but then there's no real new innovation in the past 10, 15 years, the threat of substitutes are the store brands. Who has the, you know, if the threat of substitutes is really high, you better figure out a way to reduce costs really fast. And if it becomes commoditized, what's the potential new entrance? Well, is it possible to have a new social media platform? Sure. TikTok is one that just took off like crazy. Can every social media environment have one of those? Can Google develop their own? Can Facebook develop their own? They probably can. And they integrate it with Instagram or Facebook if you're Google or WhatsApp. So what are the potential new entrants? Where are they coming from? The new entrants in those areas are coming from China because China has had their own social network environments. I mean, we have 
the Facebook kind of world here, and we have the Google kind of world here. And China has their own versions of both those. And why, you know, if Facebook and Google are were, were blocked in China, less so now than they used to be. And their, their competitors are all of a sudden competitive and maybe wanting to make inroads here. Does the buyers have the power or the sellers? Who has the power in the marketplace? So this is the five forces. There, I have other presentations from other courses on this. I'm happy to share them if anybody's interested. But I think we want to look at this in the um, concept of IT enabling these things. It is, after all, an information technology course, information systems course. So the intranet can increase the buying power by increasing price transparency. Does it really do that? Do people really check to make sure? Uh, there's plenty of articles that talk about, yes, if you want to go around and look at the price comparison from different websites, you can do that. One place where it's really worked is when things are more expensive, people are more likely to do it than when things are not. So when I did my own price comparison on Progresso Soup, Split P, I was looking at Split P Progresso Soup, uh, the prices varied dramatically. I mean, I could buy it on a Walmart site for, you know, buck 30 and it was 89 cents on Amazon and it was like uh, $2 on another site, Kroger and blah, 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 blah. What's happened in the auto industry is that there's almost no negotiating on cars anymore. Very, very little because I bought my last two cars online not from Carvana, but someplace where I could go and actually see it and test drive it. And when I was talking with the dealership and tried to negotiate, they said, you can't negotiate anymore. I said, why not? And they said, because if we don't give the best price online, you're not going to buy the car from us. So everybody's giving their best price online. So now how do I, how do I decide where I'm going to buy it from? Have we commoditized $50,000 cars. So people do check that out when they're spending $40,000, $50,000. They might not check it out when they're spending five, six, seven dollars $7. Or they're thinking, I just want the convenience of, of, of ordering. I'll, I'll order my, you know, from Taco Bell at lunch and have it door dashed to my house. And the meal costs 7 and the shipping costs 7 I don't know. All right, price transparency, degree to which complete information is available, and information asymmetry, which is the decision situation where only one party has more or better information than its counterpart. I think the internet has the ability, and that's where Google kind of search comes in, is that if I'm, if, you know, I can look on Amazon for uh, let's say I want a blue jean jacket. And that will give me all the prices of all the various versions of it they have. Let's say I want a specific one. A specific one. Levi's, you know, black jean coat. Or I can look on Amazon. If I Google it, I can get several different places that sell it. And I can see if someplace has it for a lot less. Sometimes that really is helpful. Google is good for that. So I have that price transparency. And I think the internet has helped and IT has helped do that. So that's this basic lecture. Read it. And I will put up, uh, you know, start recording the lectures for the next couple of weeks and uh, populate our website with those. Thank you very much.